Welcome to my channel. I'm grateful to have you here and I'm thankful for every single one of you that watches my videos. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. The first item that I have is entitled, Here are the three biggest findings in Florida's grand jury report on COVID wrongdoing. Um, COVID hit and basically the entire world was overwhelmed with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how do I want to put this? Um, experts telling us what to do, so-called experts telling us what to do. And anybody who questioned what they said was essentially drummed out of society. They were uh, canceled. They were uh their, their posts on social media were hidden. Uh, they got death threats. It was serious business. Now that COVID is passed, not, you know, not completely passed, it's still around, but it's not the huge alarming emergency that it was supposedly was before. Um, some of the chickens are coming home to roost. A Florida grand jury released its second interim report last week on its investigation into potential wrongdoing by COVID shot manufacturers and entities who promoted them. Requested by Governor Ron DeSantis and authorized by the Florida Supreme Court in December 2022, the grand jury was tasked with determining whether pharmaceutical manufacturers and their executive officers and other medical associations or organizations participated in criminal activity or wrongdoing concerning their involvement in the development, approval, or marketing of COVID-19 vaccines. The jury released its first interim report in February in which members confirmed the accuracy of many claims health experts and media apparatchiks dismissed as misinformation. Um, you can see the first item that they uncovered was that COVID patients gain natural immunity through infection. It's like a huge, duh, this is the case with every virus, but somehow uh, that was not the case with COVID for some reason. That's what we were told. Government experts attacked potential COVID treatments. While the grand jury noted the difficulty in finding effective treatments for a new virus amid a global outbreak, it lamented how some of government officials committed avoidable mistakes when it came to messaging and communication with the American public about potential early treatment options. Among the most notable was the expert class's war against hydroxychloroquine, a commonly used drug often prescribed to treat malaria. The jury noted how some well-credentialed scientists and clinicians were dissatisfied with the data the Food and Drug Administration used to justify its decision to revoke emergency use authorization of hydroxychloroquine for treating COVID patients, and they chose to prescribe the drug to patients based on the data they were examining. The medication's proponents argued the data cited by the FDA focused on using the drug in hospitalized patients as opposed to outpatients, contained large numbers of low-risk individuals, and had other issues undercutting its reliability. And then the third item, expert and media lies put lives at risk. Above all, the grand jury highlighted how government health experts and legacy media's efforts to squash debate about the efficacy of drugs like ivermectin created an avoidable scenario in which individuals who felt they were being lied to took matters into their own hands. Some people became so desperate to get this supposed miracle, miracle drug, so sure they were being lied to, that they began to resort to doses and formulations of the drug meant for animals, resulting in a number of well-publicized ivermectin overdoses. The report reads, once again, opponents looked down their noses at the foolishness of these desperate, misguided fools. Late night comedians made jokes at their expense and everybody who kn knew how to follow the science laughed. 
this grand jury is not laughing. This was a profound failure of public health messaging. We lay every overdose that occurred at the feet of those who authored this campaign of vilification, the grand jury added. So, uh, when I said uh, chickens are coming home to roost, what I'm referring to is that now lawsuits are coming out against what was done and we're finding out the truth. And the truth is that we were lied to, that they didn't know what they were talking about, and that the experts who spoke out and then were vilified were correct. The second article I have is the U.S. Appeals Court revives lawsuit against Mayo Clinic over COVID-19 vaccine firings. This is another aspect of the uh, uh, legal attack against what was done during COVID. <clears throat> Mayo Clinic refused to allow some people who claimed uh, religious exemptions from not taking the vaccine and not getting tested for COVID every week. And as a result, they fired them. And so now they're suing and <clears throat> the appeals court has found that the judge ruled incorrectly and that they Mayo Clinic is allowed to be sued and the lawsuit will go forward. So we'll have to see what the results of that are. But um, again, what's happening is people are starting to find out all the lies that were told. And so they're going to court to get it straightened out. The third item that I have is entitled Supreme Court Rules for NRA and New York Government Coercion Battle. This is a battle where New York officials tried to, uh, I guess browbeat would be the right word, tried to browbeat financial institutions into removing their support from the NRA, trying to make it so that basically the NRA would have no place to bank and so they'd go out of business. And the NRA is suing and the Supreme Court ruled Thursday that the National Rifle Association can pursue a claim that a New York state official's efforts to encourage companies to end ties with the gun rights group constituted unlawful coercion. The justices unanimously found that the NRA can move forward with arguments that its free speech rights under the Constitution's First Amendment were violated by the actions of Maria or Maria Vulo, or maybe Vuyo, then the superintendent of the New York State Department of Financial Services. This case was one of two before the justices concerning allegations of government coercion of private entities. The other, yet to be decided, involves claims that the Biden administration unlawfully pressured social media companies when it urged them to remove certain content. Government officials cannot attempt to coerce private parties in order to punish or suppress views that our government disfavors, Liberal Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote on behalf of the court in Thursday's ruling. The NRA, she added, plausibly alleges that Vulo did just that. So the, the case will move forward. Now that doesn't mean the NRA is going to win, but it means that the case will move forward and they can pursue it. And that's a big deal. And it's also a big deal that the Supreme Court uh, voted unanimously because that leads me to think that maybe they're going to also rule on the other case in the favor of the plaintiffs. And that case is much more consequential because it's the one where uh, the state of Missouri sued the federal government for using third-party NGOs and research organizations at universities to pressure social media into telling one story about COVID. And now it's before the Supreme Court and they will rule on it. And if they rule that the government cannot do that, which I hope they do, then that puts a, well, I was going to say that puts a stop to it, but considering that Biden completely ignores the Supreme Court rulings and goes ahead with his student loan program, maybe it won't make any difference at all. But 
in a sane world, it would mean, <laughs> a sane world, not something we don't have now. In a sane world, what it would mean is that the uh, government would have to be hands off when it comes to people saying, I don't believe you. I think you're lying to us. And they would have to convince people with facts. Wouldn't that be a change? Huh. I got a couple others on here, but I think, well, I'll go ahead with them. I was going to say I'd make it too long, but what the heck. Uh, the next article that I have is some canoes that were discovered in a lake in Wisconsin that are really turning heads in the scientific community. A 4,500 year old canoe. <laughs> These canoes were on the bottom of the lake near the shore and they they think that what these uh, the Indians were doing was storing them at the bottom of the lake in the winter so that the ice wouldn't break them up and then they would bring them back up to the surface when spring came and, and the ice went away. So that's their theory. They have to do some more research to see if that's actually the case. But they have found 11 canoes that were stored along the shore and they're not sure what it means. They think it might mean there was a village nearby. They're looking for the village now. Lots of interesting stuff there. If you're, if you're into archaeology and that kind of stuff, this is an interesting story. And finally, I have an article which I'm just going to put up on the screen. I'm not going to read anything from it, but I would suggest that you read it because it's quite well Wiccan, written. It's titled, The Activist War on Reality Accelerates. And what <clears throat> this is a Matt Taibbi article on Substack, and what he writes about is how uh, people are insisting on language changes that are just insane. And you just go, what the heck is going on? It's a lengthy article, but it's really fascinating. I, I would suggest that you read the whole thing. Um, I'll just read one little section of it for you. Some changes are offensive because of their subtlety. Want to drive a homeless person to leap through your window with a knife in his hands, in his teeth? Let him listen through the glass and overhear you correct a dining companion while scarfing up a steak dinner. It's not homeless, dear. It's unhoused. Homeless undermines self-esteem. Unhoused implies a moral and social assumption that everyone should be housed in the first place. Pass the peas, please. Boom. I'll bet most homeless people don't find the word stigmatizing. They find not having an effing home to be the problem. Unless you're unlocking your doors at night, your subtle switch from homeless to essentially unhomed, a microscopic shift of blame that one almost needs a grad degree to hear, is pure puffery, a linguistic adjustment of the cravat designed to make the speaker feel better. Boy, do I agree with this article. Like I said, it's very lengthy. I would suggest that you read it. It, it is interesting. And it makes you think about how changes that we make to how we refer to things have more underlying the, under the surface to them than what we sometimes realize. So when you change homeless to unhoused, there, there's a lot more to that than just framing a word in a way that won't offend a homeless person, supposedly. I wonder if anybody ever even asked the homeless people if they were offended by the word homeless. But, you know, uh, there's people that want to change the words for everything to, to make them more opaque so they have less meaning, so that we're all feeling good about ourselves. Silliness to me, but... Anyway, I pray for you. Oh, I have the same shirt I had yesterday, see? I pray for you that you will have an abundant life, that you'll live a long time, that you'll be healthy, that God will keep you safe from harm, and that you will be born again if you're not already. 
I pray for the same thing for every person that you love. And most of all, I pray that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.